Hi everybody, it's Matt Gleason here, President of Galaxy Marketing Solutions. And I'm taking a little bit of time to cut this video to address some of the frequently asked questions that I get recently and that I've gotten over the last couple of years. Um, there tends to be a f some common questions that usually come up and I want to make sure that I actually get these answered on video and hopefully these will be of good use to you. The whole point of this uh, thing is like getting everybody educated because that's really how marketing works the best. Like, the more educated I am and the more educated you are, the better the whole thing goes. And then we can work as a team to really make sure you expand your practice and everything works well. All right, so with that said, I'm going to get started on the slideshow. So the first thing I want to take up is this whole subject of how do I stand out from the crowd. And, you know, we've been working with dentists um, pretty primarily for about the last 10 years. Uh, we actually work with a whole broad variety of people and we are willing to market for everybody and want to, but we, when working with dentists, and that's how this question has come up, is sort of like, hey, we're all dentists, you know, like how, you know, how unique can you get dentist to dentist, you know, and how do I actually um, accomplish that key marketing goal, which is to really differentiate yourself and come across as your own unique thing. So it's actually kind of a simple answer to that because um, in truth, even though you are all dentists or you're all physical therapists or chiropractors or what have you, you are all different. And it's really just a matter of exploring uh, and laying out like where you came from, what your purposes are, um, why you decided to do what you do, um, you know, what drives you and what got you into that position, um, why you took that profession and so forth. All those things are really key and they are unique to you and they are strong enough to definitely carry your brand on its own. You know, all any brand really is, is just the backstory of the company and what motivated people to get started and why do they carry on. And you have your own unique story. So it's really a matter of just unearthing that and getting that told and then there you are. You do stand out from the crowd. Here's a good uh, quote I saw recently I want to relay. This is from the founder of Amazon. And he says, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So that when they are talking about you or they're talking to their friends, you know, what comes out of their mouth? Obviously, we want this to be good things. So um, in order to, to get that communicated to your public, in order to create that kind of effect on your public, there's basically a checklist of several things that, um, that you can walk through to really isolate what your brand is and what you stand for. And uh, one thing I'd like to talk about is this, these kind of actions, like sitting down and working this stuff out, is maybe not the first thing on people's mind or they think, yeah, I've got to produce instead or we have to generate revenue or whatever. But these, um, taking the time to actually organize and get your thoughts clarified about who you are and what you deliver is very well worth it because then you have, it's like you're putting your railroad tracks out into the future and you know exactly where you're going to go. So with that said, this is uh, a checklist that we use, and it's really helpful, and I'm going to keep it up here for a bit, so if you want to make a screenshot or whatever, because these questions, like if they're really fully answered, they, you will establish your brand with these. So just to walk through these really quick, um, you have to look at what benefit you provide your patients, and so, you know, and really look at it. You know, of course, you're going to straighten their spine or fix their teeth or help them recover or whatever the case may be. But there's probably some other benefits that you deliver as well, you know, like a, a welcoming environment, you make them feel reassured, um, just whatever benefits you deliver to, to your patients. And then what services do you provide? Like name them all out, get them all expressed in writing. And these kind of um, practical exercises can be very eye-opening, you know, when you take a look at how much stuff you actually deliver. Sometimes it's quite a lot, or sometimes you find you need to add some things or that um, maybe you offer a bunch of things, but there's a few that are just the core products that are really moving you ahead, and maybe you can drop some other things and add some new things or whatever. The point is to go through the checklist so you really have those realizations on your own. Um, the other one is to take a look at the way you do business with your patients, like how do they feel when they walk in? How, does the, how, how is the environment of the place? How do you handle such things as billing and, you know, payment options and, um, you know, how do you stay in touch with them? How do you remind them to come in without irritating them? All those elements. 
Um, the next one is the personality of the practice. And, uh, you know, definitely this is part of any company kind of has its own personality. You know, if you think of the big company, you know, think of Apple, for example. When I think of Apple, I get this personality of, like, man, this is, like, like super innovative. You know, they're expected to innovate all the time. They have these very highly slick products that work very well. And they're also kind of like um, they're a gathering place for some of the top minds. You know, so it has kind of like this, this whole personality to me. And certainly the same thing can be accomplished for an office. Like um, one great example of this is our friend, um, uh, our friends Lauren and Tony Hatch. They have a dental office in Scripps Rocks, San Diego area. And so they, they gave their practice this whole personality of rock. You know, Scripps Rocks is all a rock and roll theme. And the whole company is like, um, it just has like this youthful rock and roll uh, kind of energy to it. And there's, you know, there's statues and pictures of rock and roll artists. And anyway, it's really cool. And it's very creative. So um, take a moment and figure out what you want to do along those lines. And what it, it's going to be whatever is natural for you, whatever, you, whatever is really represents you. Um, okay, good. Moving on, we want to look at who you service. Like, who's your actual public, you know? Do you... Um, do you service the, the broad array of mankind or, you know, are there certain key demographics that tend to be your public? You really want to isolate that because um, those are the people you're talking to and that's your audience. And that people is going to have particular characteristics. And there's going to be particular things that you would say to that group of people that you may not say to another group of people. So you really want to hone in on that. Um, the next thing is what do you guarantee or what do you promise? And that's a really big one. And, you know, when you stick your neck out and you say, you know, I guarantee this or I promise this, um, you know, within reason, of course, but, like, you want to show that you're sticking your neck out a bit and you're, like, showing some commitment to your product. And it's a reassuring factor for sure. You know, it can be, it can be one of those things that really helps a person to decide to go visit you. You are like, well, if, I, if I'm not totally happy, my next visit is free. Or, you know, I, you know something that gives them a reassurance. Um, the next thing uh, is something I talk about a lot, which is how your office looks. And I really think, you know, as a, as a public service facility, um, I would say at least every couple months, maybe more often, you should do that drill. It's called the viewpoint drill, where you actually start away from the office and you walk towards it and you wipe your mind clean of the fact that you work there every day and, you know, you once you've worked at a place for quite a while, you can kind of get kind of numb to it and you... You almost stop seeing things, but I want you to not do that in this case and actually go through and really look and take it in through the eyes of a visitor and, like, you know, can you find the place? Is the signage very observable? How does it look? Like, are the hedges trimmed? You know, how does it feel when you walk in? Is it observably clean? Um, how's the general tone of the office and that kind of thing? That is all part of your marketing. You know, like we could send out the most brilliant postcards and have the most amazing website, but then the office is like the Adams Family House or something, and, you know, it's like you kill it right there. So the whole machine has to be in place, whatever you're doing out into the society and on the Internet, and then when they finally do arrive in your office, you know, it all has to kind of integrate and match for one big experience. So the next thing is um, that kind of goes along with this is how your employees actually look. And I know this is something that I definitely pay attention to when I when I go into any place, whether it's a restaurant or an office of some kind or whatever. And it's not just like the attire. I mean, the attire is important, definitely, you know, whether they're just dressing nice or they're dressing in a uniform or whatever. I also really tend to look at just the guys, you know, the people, the, the men and women. Like, how are they doing? You know, do they are they glad to be there? You know, have they got some energy about them? Like, um you know, there's some there's good production happening, and they're they're happy to work there, and they're happy to service the clients. You know, is that kind of positive energy happening, or, or are they kind of like moping around and like obviously <laughs> not too happy about things or whatever? Because obviously that's an indicator. And you know, you can be assured, like if the staff are happy and well taken care of, as a client, you're going to be well taken care of. You know, it's just an indicator of the general tone of the office. So. Um, the more happy the employees are, the better. You know, if there's someone who is having a hard time or seems to have kind of a cloud over their head, you know, you should care for that person and pull them aside and find out what's going on. Um, in most of the cases, the staff are actually 
great, willing staff, and they may just be having some losses because they haven't been trained yet or they're running into things they don't know how to handle. So their morale is kind of dipping a bit um, and they're starting to get self-conscious of that. So um, it's going to be unique for every person, but pull them aside and find what they're running into and do your best to help them out, you know, and, and, and make it a winning game for them because that not only will they win and you'll win, but it's part of the marketing, honestly. Like, that will be very visible to the people walking into the office. All right, and then um, in more practical terms, like your logo, you know, your color choices, your color schemes, even the fonts you use on your promotion, that's all part of your brand. You know, like certain fonts, like the Coca-Cola font, the, you know, Apple, you a very unique font. You know, like that's part of the stamp of that company. All right, so um, please take a good look at this, at this list and screenshot it or whatever you want to do. And then I really encourage, like, actually setting aside a proper meeting. I mean, it, you know, to go through this thing thoroughly, I mean, that could wind up to be like a five-hour order pizza, work it out type of thing. But it would be time well spent because it, it really helps to pull, it help, really helps the vision of the company to gel and gives you a really, agree, you know, a stable and agreed upon um, image to put out to the public, which is your brand. Okay? All right, let's move on. Here's another thing that comes up is the whole subject of the front desk and the receptionist. And what if my front desk staff are a little prickly or, you know, they're a little hard to get along with or a little unfriendly or, or what? So now I'm really going to go into a long tirade <laughs> and actually a, a ultimately a praise and celebration of a good receptionist because they are so, so key. So your receptionist sets the tone for your entire office. And I just like to say that up front and kind of get this person recognized for what they are. They are your brand ambassador. No matter how long you've gone to your medical school and done your training and how long you've practiced for, no matter how experienced your office managers are, et cetera, et cetera, the person who's actually the foreface of the company is this receptionist. You can't skimp on this position at all, right? It's critically important and actually totally influences the success of your marketing, okay? So the first point is you have to choose wisely. And, you know, for me, in the subject of hiring, you know, I mean, you have kind of your ideal of, like, the person's, uh, you know, very, their emotional tone is very high, they're, like, cheerful or above, and they're super experienced and trained. You know, that would be kind of like the ultimate thing. But given the choice between someone who's, like, a little less cheerful but super experienced versus someone who's really cheerful and eager and wants to learn, I would definitely choose the person who's really eager and wants to learn and is just friendly and has that energy to them because that person you can train up. You know, you can, you can train them up and mold them into what you want. So um, you got to choose wisely. They must be friendly and have the intention to help and bring people in. They actually have to be willing to have lots of people. And by that I mean they have to be willing to experience a lot of people coming in and not be thrown off by that, you know. Um, you've probably seen this in life, but, you know, different people kind of live at different levels of tolerance of action, you know. Some people like it really quiet and they just don't like too much going on and they actually, their intention is to keep things or even bring things to that level so that it's comfortable for them. So that person we do not want as a receptionist at all. What we, we want is the extroverted very friendly, reaching type of person who actually likes the excitement of a little bit of confusion and random motion and stuff like that, of like a bunch of people coming in. They like that stuff, you know. So because, you know, I don't want to sound too mystical, but like, you know, the person you put on that front desk, you know, they arrive with their whole universe. You know, they arrive with all of how they approach life, their own considerations about life, their own considerations about how much motion they can tolerate. And they're going to plug that in your office and your marketing machine. And so you want someone plugged in there that's, that has a high, like actually enjoys a lot of action and motion. This is a, like a pretty critical point. If someone is super conservative on the front desk and quiet and so forth, you could want, it could actually literally affect your numbers because they're kind of squashing it. Hope that makes sense. Here's the next point. Um, their own emotional tone must match or be higher than the caller. And, uh, you know, 
part of our quality control technique is um, we have tracking numbers where you can actually go in to a campaign and listen to the phone calls that are coming in from the postcards or the website. And the one thing that really makes me feel like I've been literally like punched in the stomach like, oh, God, is when someone pretty cheerful or enthusiastic calls in and goes, hey, I just got your postcard. Wow, I'd really like to become a new patient. You know, uh, when can I come in? And then the, the receptionist is going like, what's your name, please? Okay, hang on. Let me put you on hold. Yeah, it, it literally feels like I've been punched in the stomach when I hear that because very obviously the caller's emotional tone is actually much higher than the receptionist. And with a person calling in enthusiastic like that, you have an energy that you can develop and work with and develop and actually increase. And it's this great thing. Right, that's a, like a natural resource. You've got someone calling in who has that enthusiasm. That's a natural resource that you can match and then you can build upon it and you really have something. If you come in at a lower tone, your receptionist does, it actually kills it and right away is like counter-promotional to your office and makes the person feel less welcome. And honestly, a, a person who's more lower like that is less real to the caller. So right away there's like a rub there. So the receptionist's own emotional tone must match or be higher than the caller, all right? And then the next point, train them so that they win. Give them a basic script, just have them note down and actually drill how to handle the rougher scenarios they encounter. And just true professionals drill, drill, drill to perfection. You know, whether they're an athlete or a musician or whatever, it's common. They're having trouble with their backhand. They drill, drill, drill it. So what about the guy who calls in and is just a shopper? Like that's one of the most challenging calls. You drill, drill, drill how to handle that so you get the guy in. You know, or the guy who comes in and he's a little bit snarly. You drill that scenario, have the, person, have the staff member team up with another staff member and work it out until they're totally confident. Um, we use a great article called Getting New Patients in the Door by Laura Hatch. She's um, an expert in the whole front desk um, operation and training. She has her own website and training uh, videos called front desk, or sorry, frontofficerocks.com. And um, I, there's a great article that she wrote that we use to help our clients and their front desk. So let me know if you want a free copy. I'm going to give you my email address at the end of this, and I'd be happy to send that to you. And then just in conclusion, receptionists are on the front lines. You know, they deserve a lot of respect. They, they're on the front lines and they get the whole gamut of humanity. So back them up, you know, get them trained. If they're having losses, find out what they're running into, have them drill and practice it, and keep them propped up because they are like, <clears throat> they're literally your ambassador. So um, keep them happy, okay? All right, we're going to move on. So how do I handle trouble source patients? Now this is, you know, you could link this to marketing. If you have a guy in your office, you know, a patient who is lower toned and giving people a hard time and depressing the general vibe and atmosphere of the office, um, that definitely bleeds into becoming a marketing issue because it definitely affects your, you know, the friendly atmosphere of your place. So the first thing is to understand that there is such a thing as a trouble source like, this is not your imagination. Uh, you know, one of the things these guys tend to try to do is introvert you, um, get you thinking that things are your fault. You know, I'm not saying, you know, nobody's perfect, right? But, you know, they, they try to capitalize on things to introvert you and get you thinking that it's your fault and stuff like that and put you kind of on the defensive. Um, but you should know that this is an actual type of person. They're the trouble source. Fortunately, they're a relatively small percentage. Um, but they will tie up your staff. They will manufacture complaints and ask for special favors and compensations. They will make you wrong and try to put you on the defensive. And, you know, if you, if you just find yourself thinking things to yourself or even saying, like, hey, other people don't act like that, or, like, I would never do that, you know, if you're back in the break room and you're like, man, Mr. Jones, like, I would never do that. Like, these are just some kind of red flags because you're right. You know, other people don't act like that. And you, you probably would never do some of the things that these guys do. So, if, you know, if, um, if you find somebody coming up more often than not with those kind of thoughts or statements, like you have to actually check this out because you may just have a guy who's pretty dedicated 
to being a trouble source. And a good example of this is, I don't know uh, how much you guys shop online, but if you go to Amazon or, or any other online shopping thing, and it's a good product and it tends to have like four or five star reviews, and there's usually like without fail, the guy who's the one star review guy, and he's like the worst experience ever, and he just rants on and on and on about what a horrible person you are, <laughs> what a horrible experience he had. You know, it's almost become kind of cliche. Of course, there's always going to be the one review. Well, that's the trouble source guy. You know, and fortunately, he has a small percentage. So, um, but you do have to be heads up because it can really, it can tie up people's time and agitate staff and other patients. And it actually does affect the general flows of your office and, and your marketing results. I want to put this disclaimer in because, like, you know, people do have bad days. Um, sometimes staff do mishandle something and get somebody a little riled up. So facts of the matter, like reach out with live communication and just really get like what the guy's upset about, what occurred, make it totally safe with no other agenda and just get him, let him talk, give him a good acknowledgement and just find out what's what. And so if, if there was a legit point that the person is upset about, a good conversation will sort it out, then you can just say, hey, I'm really sorry that occurred. It's obviously not our intention and things go that way. Let's do blah. And you can kind of just get it back on the rails very easily. Now, if you sit down to get the facts of the matter and the guy is just still nothing, you know, this is wrong and this is wrong and I think you guys need to pay me this and blah, 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 you are dealing with a trouble source, all right? So along that line, you have to observe what you observe. You know, keep your own integrity in and trust your own perceptions. And you have to be willing to inform a confirmed trouble source that the relationship is not working out and it's best if you part ways. You know, you just do that very professionally and, you know, we'd be willing to send your, your files to another doctor or what have you, but um, at this point in time, I don't think this relationship is going to work out. And you just have to man up or woman up and just do that. And actually, um, when that is done, when you have a bona fide trouble source and that is done and the person gets off your lines, the office will chill out. You will be able to see the tone of the office rise up everyone will be happier and you'll get more done. I've just seen it many times, okay? So I just wanted to cover that point because it is a real point and it's not in your imagination. These guys are out there, but getting, talk to them and have a real conversation and really verify that they are a trouble source and not just having a bad day or whatever. Okay, good, let's move on then. So here's another one. Now this is just a whole series of different questions that's slightly randomly ordered, but this one now moves into how do I know which marketing channels will work the best in my city? And I just want to discuss that a little bit because uh, marketing is an interesting subject because it's about people and it's about cultures and time periods and regions and fads and um, things like that. And so it's kind of it's kind of shifts in a certain way, but by the same token, there are certain principles that always remain the same. Um, and I have a picture of San Francisco here, which is where I was born. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And since I was over there, now it's become like this tech capital of the planet, really, between San Francisco itself and the Silicon Valley. That's like where it's all happening. So you have a population there. You have kind of like a, the older school population. And then you have a whole population of very tech savvy, you know, people who are like, you know, just live in the Internet universe and the digital universe. And that's where they get all their data. That's how they manage their life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I just bring this up because in this particular region, like, you know, this area we found in a particular area of San Francisco didn't respond so well to postcards, but responded much better to um, online advertising, search engine optimization, and, and that kind of thing. Um, Unless the postcard campaign was in a particular niche, like we had a particular doctor who was, had this whole niche of like green dentistry, and she really did green dentistry to the hilt, and that really resonated with the San Francisco people, so her postcards did quite well. So it's just something to be aware of, that different areas are going to respond differently. And, um, and, you know, marketing is, you know, whenever I think of marketing, I think of like one of those big three-masted sailing ships, you know, and you just... You stock the ship and you put it together as well as you can and then you set sail. And you a little bit have to sail and see how the thing rolls and adjust accordingly, okay? So the first step of this is just to observe. 
And this is an, an actual marketing skill is to kind of step outside of yourself and observe, like, how do you get your information just in your day-to-day -day operations? What, like, how do you find out about stuff? Like, the last time you decided to try something, how did you find out about it? And another thing you can do is survey your existing patients regarding how they tend to find out about things. You know, and if you want to get really brave, you can go out on the street and um, survey the man on the street and give him a toothbrush or a gift card or exchange. Um, and really find out, like, how are people getting their information? Because um, a key maxim of marketing is that you want to go where people's eyeballs are, you know? So if their eyeballs in San Francisco are primarily glued to their iPhone, um, which is probably the case, then obviously that's where you want to show up. You want to show up on uh, mobile devices very well. You want to advertise on mobile devices, et cetera. Um, so a lot of it is just the observation of how people actually operate in um, different regions behave differently. But one thing that's really a constant that I, um, that I want to reemphasize is there is a general trend of the rise of the Internet. I'm sure you guys have all seen this, but basically the Internet has definitely risen in importance over the last several years, and it's just continuing to do that. So one thing that we always make sure, like, like for instance, if, um, if somebody signs up with a postcard campaign with us, we, as part of that, we always check out their website because we know that the two really work together. Like, we could have the most brilliant postcard ever created. It's a complete killer. But somebody would, might read it and go, man, this is a killer. I just want to go to his website to read up on the guy a little bit, maybe read a couple of reviews before I call and make my appointment. And if the website is lacking or it does not um, come up as easy to read and navigate on his phone, or if it's somehow out of sync with this postcard, it doesn't have the new patient offer on the home page. The home page should basically have all, everything you may need um, to make a decision to come in. Um, for instance, you know, you have to have this viewpoint that when people are, are looking around and looking online and looking at your website, they may never even get past the home page. So you have to deliver everything you want to deliver right there, which is like, your new patient special, there should be a nice picture of the doctor, short uh, You should have some key buttons from your surveys, you know, what people find important about a dentist or a chiropractor or whatever, right on the home page, because that will pull people in. And it's, you have to deliver with that home page, bang. You know, it's, not a, it's really not enough to have, like, meet our staff, like, three taps back, and they have to click, click, click to go, to go learn about the guy. You know, in real practical terms, you want all the core information that someone would look for right on the home page. So I just want to emphasize that. It's just kind of a truth, you know, in, in today's Internet world. Okay, good. So let's move on to the next one here. All right. Now here's, here's a question. How can I help my community attract more attention and get better marketing results all at the same time? Like, what would that take? some kind of like contract with the devil or something like that? <laughs> Not necessarily. This is actually enters a, a, a subject that is close to but not the same as marketing, and that is public relations. And, you know, you often hear public relations in the same breath, like, oh, yeah, that's Julie. She handles PR and marketing and so forth. But they are definitely separate subjects. And um, public relations is the activity of making good works which is to say charitable actions, like you're giving of yourself, you're giving of your time, you're not asking for anything back, making good works well known. And um, this is very successful, and the, the practices that we find that are really doing well uh, have this going on, and they're getting known in their community well beyond the fact that they may be a dentist or a chiropractor or whatever. They're getting known in their community as somebody who cares and who has his own causes that he's passionate about and is willing to get involved in that. And that has quite a ripple effect and really builds a lot of admiration. And so then when you come along with your Internet ads or with your postcard campaign, you have much more traction with the people receiving. You know, it's not just coming cold. You know, a well-done marketing piece will produce cold, but it can only be aided if you're also doing public relations activities. So let me tell you a little bit more. Um, to get this going, if it's not already, you want to just find causes that you are passionate about. 
and this is kind of goes back to like what is what is your brand? I mean, your brand is basically you. You know, it just it just taking the time to really isolate your story and what you're passionate about and going with that and just celebrating, you know, who you are and what you stand for and acting on that. So you want to find causes you're passionate about and just get involved, or you can also survey to find causes that your patients in your community are passionate about, um, which is a very good idea. Like I was talking to one of our clients um, pretty recently, and we were talking about this very point, and there were two main things in her area. People were concerned about drug use in particular neighborhoods, and they love their dogs. So these are like common points of agreement, you know, and so we talked about um, doing, uh, putting out pamphlets that were kind of like educating on drugs and why you shouldn't take them and what to do. And then also setting up like a very dog friendly practice where people were just walking by, their dog can get a drink of water and have a snack or whatever. And you know, this, this sounds very simple, but it actually strikes some pretty deep, deep chords in people. And it actually does a lot to, um, to get you out of non-existence, non-existence be known and get people admiring that you're taking some action. So um, you want to figure out, find out what you're passionate about or find out what your community is passionate about and figure out how to get involved in these. It's usually not hard. There's usually groups already existing that you can just tap into. And then this is the key thing. You actually want to document and promote your activities. That's the public relations part. And I just want to take this point up because I've had a few people who are actually do some really nice stuff from the heart, you know, but they have a bit of consideration that it's like, well, you know, I just do this to give back and I don't really want to, um, I don't want to really want to take credit for it or, um, you know, I don't really want to publicize it or whatever. They kind of have this thing about it. And in actual fact, um, I would like to kind of like really remove that idea because there's nothing wrong with promoting your activities and documenting them and there's everything right about doing that. It will demonstrate your care and will also draw attention to whatever cause it is you're working towards. So that could only help. So it's really a win-win situation. So if you have any of that consideration, um, you know, I'm going to ask you to get beyond that. <laughs> you know, I just, it means you don't have to take some crazy distasteful pictures, but just, just document what you do, the truth of it, and get that promoted on your website, on your social media, and however else, and that's public relations. It's your good works well known. And then in conclusion, PR activities not only help the world, but they establish admiration for you and your team and can greatly improve your marketing results. So there you go. All right, let's move on. Here's a question I sometimes get, which is, do postcards still work? You know, and I've definitely had people say, yeah, man, people don't even, you know, they, they get thrown away instantly and... Um, people don't even read their mail anymore or whatever. You know, people establish these ideas about um, postcards and so forth. Now, um, just as a point of fact, Galaxy Marketing Solutions was built on postcard campaigns, and that is still our mainstay today. So the answer to the question if they work is definitely yes, it, they still work. But they need to be done correctly. And I'm going to go over some of the core points that we find to be really pivotal points in getting a postcard campaign to really produce for you. So one thing, like, you know, I've talked to a lot of doctors and so forth and a lot of practices and, um, you know, on many occasions they brought their promotion piece and they say, yeah, this is what we've been sending out and so forth. And in a lot of cases, the postcard is kind of like this whole menu, you know, like we do this and we do this and we do this and we do this. And that actually works against you in 99% of the cases because the thing with advertising is it's got to be a very clarified point that you're making. Like you grab hold of the reader's attention with some imagery and some survey buttons, you direct their attention through a very specific communication, and then you deliver your single message. Like we have a new patient special. It's $99 for exam x-ray and cleaning. Call here now. And it's a very controlled thing. You grabbed a hold of their attention, you guided it through a, a particular course, and you delivered your message commanded to do something. And what occurs is when you have um, a piece of promotion that's got this, and yeah, we have lumineers, and we have come in and get your root canal, and blah, 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 or get your spine adjusted, a 
massage and we also do acupuncture and we also do this and this and this and this, um, it winds up dispersing the person's attention and you lose the impact of the advertising. So what I would instead suggest, like a place um, that has like acupuncture and chiropractic and so forth, I would actually run individual campaigns for each of those services so that you can deliver that single message. And you get a guide to get that message and then take action. All right? So then um, the other thing I've been talking about surveys and survey buttons, we always recommend getting about 30 to 40 surveys done so that you know what people want. You know, you don't have to sit in a boardroom and try to be a screaming genius about what's important to people. It's actually as simple as just asking them what's important to them, and they will tell you, you know, and that's the surveys. And then um, there's a particular way to tabulate the surveys, which we can help you with. And then you have some raw data that when you put it out on your website, when you on your postcards or wherever else, this is like bona fide data that will really help establish agreement and, and get people interested so that you can deliver your message to them. Um, so that's a, we talk a lot about surveys and we turn to surveys often so that we're not trying to figure it out. You know, we're just asking people and giving the people what they want. Okay, let's move on. So. Um, Kind of back to my other point, you want to use a single new patient offer that people will go for. In the world of dentistry, we always go for exam, x-ray, and cleaning. Um, we've had some clients try to really sell us on the idea of not offering a cleaning, and really kind of, <laughs> we've had a few that were, it was a little bit of a wrestling match because they, they just didn't see the value in it or they were concerned it would be too time consuming or whatever. And the truth is, like out of all the campaigns that we've done, which is a lot, the exam x-ray and cleaning is hands down the thing. And it really comes back to, you know, in any, like marketing is not for the dentist per se. And it's not for his convenience or whatever. It's really the art of offering something that will, will be responded to. So here you really have to take the viewpoint of the guy receiving the card. And this is an actual marketing skill. You know, if you're a dentist, you have to forget that you're a dentist, forget your world, and flip around to being the world of Joe Citizen who receives your postcard. How does that come across? And is the offer tantalizing enough to actually reach for it? I've definitely had dentists that were trying to, like, basically close me on, let's skip the cleaning and let's just do exam and x-ray. Now, I can tell you, if I received a postcard that was offering me an exam and an x-ray, I would be totally underwhelmed. You know, to me, that's just fluffy, like, I don't know. It's nothing, there's substance there, you know. I can't really hang my hat on anything. But whereas um, when, when the cleaning is put in there, there's a perceived value, and the person will go for it because they're kind of like, well, I don't know anything about this dentist, but I like his promotion. It looks nice. It's eye-catching, and I'm going to go in there, and for a good price, I'm going to get my teeth clean. And that's, like, very tangible, you know. And even if I hate the guy, I'm going to walk out with clean teeth, and, like, that's acceptable, so I'm going to go for it. See, there's enough tangibility there that they'll actually reach for it. We just have not, and I'm just telling you this, and I'm maybe over-telling you this, but we just have not had success in omitting um, a cleaning so in the world of dentistry, so please bear that in mind. Okay, let's see into my rant on that. Let's carry on. So now the other thing is you want to use in, on your postcards, for example, and also on your website, you want to use imagery that communicates. And let me give you a couple of examples. Like, like one of the things that really connects with people and gets them engaged in communication is that the images are, are realistic. You know, so like you look at the postcard and the people on it look like the people you actually see on the street and in the supermarket and so forth. So, um, and interestingly, some clients have been inclined to try to go for like some super gorgeous or like celebrity looking, super made up model, um, which might have some application, like if maybe like one postcard for cosmetic or something like that. But if you're talking more about general dentistry or, or chiropractic or whatever, we really actually kind of shy away from trying to go for like the ultra drop dead gorgeous woman on the postcard. 
We even, we even kind of coined a term one day, it was called hot chick syndrome. Just because that there were, you know, there were these cards going on and they actually weren't working that well. And the, the analysis point is that sort of like the girl was so gorgeous, it just it was a little bit unreal. And it, it, it actually lost some of its communication power. So we usually just go for like, okay, what do real people look like in your area? And let's find imagery that really reflects that and get that on your promotion because that's going to strike a chord with people. Okay, good. The next point is um, you have to repeat your message to the same group of people over and over. And you, you may well be aware of this already. This is a huge maximum of marketing. Um, you know, if you think of some of these massive brands like Coca-Cola and Apple and whoever else, these guys never stop. Man, they ne you know, you would think Apple, okay, they're all set. You know, they don't have to advertise. Everyone knows Apple. Everyone's got an iPhone practically or whatever, or at least knows the company. They're all set. They don't need to, to advertise, and it's not even true. You know, they just relentlessly, they know that they have to have their promotion and marketing happening relentlessly. And the, the same is true for your practice. So um, in, the, in the realm of postcards particularly, you have to re repeat your message to the same group of people over and over. And then you have to mail out enough cards per week to really have an effect. And um, this is another little rant of mine. It's a mini rant. But anyways, we, we, at Galaxy, we, um, we don't go below 1,000 cards per week. So that's like 4,000 like 4, name mailing list with 1,000 cards per week every four weeks. That means if I'm in your field, I get your card about every month. And the thing is, is that a is very bottom level, and we actually definitely try to go for more than that. Like 2,000 cards a week is definitely, we feel like, okay, this is great because it's a much bigger fishing net, and we're very sure that that's going to work well. And then some of our very tried and true clients, man, they do a lot more than that. You know, um, we have a client, you know, we have several clients who do 3,000 cards a week, 4,000 cards a week. We have one that does 7,000 cards a week. And, you know, it's just any practice is a game. You know, you do what, you, what the budget or you can make the budget allow to get started. But I really want to put this in there is you have to begin with enough cards so that it will actually cause something. And just as a little bit more on that, like, for example, even just moving from 1,000 postcards a week to 1,500 postcards a week is actually a fairly substantial change. Because if you're doing 1,500 cards a week, that's like, you can reach 6,000 people, four times 1,500, you can reach 6,000 people in a month, um, which is 50% more. You know, it's like, it's more than, it's much more than 1,000 cards per week. And if you do 2,000 cards a week, now you're reaching out to a mailing list of 8,000 to potentially 10,000 people. So you're, it really expands. And if you can make it work to do those larger numbers, like you definitely, the sheer volume of cards going out definitely makes a difference. So, you know, we've even had people try to go like, hey, I want to get started, but I can't do 1,000 cards a week. So we just try to work with them and work out the budget and stuff so that we can actually just start correctly because we just haven't seen it really work well the other way. You know, like, hey, I'll start with 500 a week and see how it goes. We just haven't seen that really work out. So um, I just wanted to let you know that. All right, carrying on. I've said this a million times already, but you want to support your postcard campaign with a great website and lots of testimonials and online reviews. I've been talking a lot about testimonials and online reviews recently. Um, they are a clincher. You know, mar marketing, um, gain, you know, postcards gain interest and they can drive a lot of people in by themselves. But a lot of people do still go to a website and are looking for online reviews and stuff as kind of the final clincher. You know, like, hey, I like this doctor's promotion and he says all the right things, but like, do people really like him or what? You know, like, what do my fellow citizens say? So um, that's, that's where the testimonials come in and they really have that closing power, like that clinching power that um, is enough to really go, okay, look, you know, it looks like a lot of people in my town like this guy, so I'm gonna call in. All right, and then um, the final point is direct mail has to be permitted to mail out and mail out and mail out. You gotta be patient and let it grab hold and work. Our top clients never stop mailing. I can totally understand too, like if you invest in a postcard campaign and you're like, man, I'm gonna get this going. Okay, I paid some money and you know, let's get this going. And then like a few weeks, roll out and it's like your door's not being beaten down, I can understand that you might get a little bit like, okay, man, let's get going. 
you have to just realize that you're dealing with like a longer cycle of action. You know, you have started, and that's good. And the repetition is establishing your traction. And you re honestly, you just have to be patient and just keep mailing out. And um, like our top clients, they just mail and they mail and they mail and they never stop because they know that they're just planting seeds. And those seeds blossom, you know, sooner or they blossom later. But as long as they keep up that uh, persistent communication, it keeps driving people in. So um, you got to be a little bit patient. You know, a campaign that's well put together will start to gain traction. Um, it said it usually... We don't expect nothing, you know, as you start. Like, we expect you to start getting some action, but once the guy's starting to get, like, his third postcard, fourth postcard, fifth postcard, now you're starting to get into, like, the full peak of the campaign where you're really gaining traction, and you should definitely be able to see that in your own statistics. Okay? All right. Here's a big question I get. Honestly, this I get this question a lot from people who didn't necessarily grow up during the Internet time and, you know, did not grow up with a cell phone glued to their hand and <laughs> their eyes glued to the screen and working Facebook and other social media all the time. And so the social media thing is a little bit unreal to them still, um, or it's viewed as maybe kind of a fad or, you know, just like a um, form for cat videos or what have you. And I want to kind of disabuse you of that and show you the actual real power of social media. So... What social media is in actual fact is word of mouth in the year 2015 and beyond. And, you know, if you look back in the earlier days and earlier decades, like let's say the 40s or something like that, or the 30s even, or the 50s, um, you know, in a, in a town, the word of mouth was very powerful. And if you were the butcher and you sold someone a bad leg of lamb, like the, you know, and they got sick or whatever, the, the word about that would get out pretty quickly. And it, it would, you know, in church groups or across back fences or at the pool hall or wherever, like that would spread and it would very much um, the business of that butcher, right? By the same time, if you did a great job, that would get out too, you know. Someone throws a big dinner party and the food's awesome and they're like, where did you get your ham? You know, oh, I got it from Joe the Butcher. Really, I've been meaning to try him. I'm going to go there next weekend, you know. Like that stuff is real. And I think most people know that word of mouth marketing is actually the most powerful there is because uh, the message is being relayed by people that are close to somebody and who they trust. So social media is word of mouth marketing on steroids. And basically the, the different social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, Google+, et cetera, are the plumbing pipes that the modern word of mouth flows through. And when you really conceive of it that way, it's actually like an incredible resource because you don't even pay anything for this um, pretty much so. You don't even pay anything. And if you really work it, um, you can get a lot of return from your social media. So now th there is kind of a right way and a wrong way to use social media. Um, definitely the wrong way is to keep um, asking people to buy stuff over and over again because it just – social media is a social – it's like going to a cocktail party or something like that. And then there's an exchange of ideas, and you put stuff out that's interesting. It's just like a conversation. You put out something that's interesting. The person reads it, gets some kind of benefit from it, replies, oh, my God, that was great. And then you reply back saying, oh, thanks, Julie. I'm so glad you liked it. Yeah, we're going to keep these posts up. And then she writes, and then she gives a smiley face back. Well, that is actually fairly significant because you're developing a rapport with that person and you're actually establishing yourself also as like an authority in your field, you know, like a source of great information in whatever your field is, and an educational source. And so actually the bulk of your posts should be informative, and, you know, they can be sometimes funny or just nice um, or aesthetic things. The bulk of them should be like that and shouldn't really be asking for anything. Then once in a while when you do ask for something, there's so much rapport built up that that ask is very well received. And there's a bit of a thing, too, where the person receives so much valuable information from you that they're inclined to go like, well, you know what, this guy never really asked me to do anything, so I will buy his blah, 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 or I will sign up for that treatment plan or whatever. So that there's the right way to work it. 
And I think the best analogy is like if you were at a cocktail party and some guy marched up and tried to sell you an electric toothbrush right off the bat without even introducing himself, you'd be a little bit like, please get out of my face, you know. <laughs> but if if he came up to you and in the course of conversation it came up that he um, is an inventor and invented a toothbrush and just left it at that and then you see him later and, and you talk about something totally else and then you see him later and you talk about the football team and then later you see him again and then you ask about what he invented and then he shows it to you and he says, hey, by the way, it's on sale. And you say, really, how much is it? And it's like, actually, it's like, it's 20% off. You know, it's only $19.99. Really? And it, okay, I'll get one. You know, now the rapport is there so the sale happens easily and no one gets irritated or whatever. All right, you get my point, I think. And then just carrying on, so you do not ignore what people say. People must be sincerely acknowledged that there's a real two-way conversation. Like, don't post something and then someone replies, oh, my God, that's awesome, and then you ignore them. Like, that's, this is bad form. You know, you, you need to be enough on the ball so you're paying attention to people's responses and you're at least replying with, like, thanks very much, Joe. Great to hear from you. We'll see you soon. Like, that ties it up in a bow, leaves Joe feeling good, and you've just expanded your rapport and your strength, the strength of your community. Um, so engagement is the whole point. You will build rapport and create a community. Social media is here to stay, so please learn and use it. Okay, so let's carry on. So now we go to this point of own your town. So this is Galaxy's tagline, and it's really born out of the idea that um, someone who really surveys the people in the area and surveys their patients and um, puts out relevant content and promotes on the various different channels available can really rise to a point where they kind of own their town. You know, they're like the obvious and clear choice. And part of getting to that ultimate of own your town is to do an exercise where you actually envision your ideal scene. You know, and uh, this is actually, again, like this kind of thing is worth it all. This isn't just some exercise because this really lets you step back and say, like, where is this ship headed? Where do we want to take it? And kind of the, the irreducible minimum that some activities fall into is they kind of just motor along at a certain rate and they just kind of handle what comes in and so forth. And there may not be, like, a whole forward vision or, like, want to be month by month or any of that kind of like strategic leadership type of energy poured into it. So they can kind of just keep motoring along at the same rate, but the world being what it is, things change, um, things get more expensive, cultures change, and you have to be kind of thinking into the future. Um, so I wanted to discuss this subject of envisioning your ideal scene and actually taking a look at like, well, where are we headed with this? Where do we want to go? I mean. In the world of dentistry, I've talked to dentists who want a whole empire. You know, they want tons of practices and they, they really want an empire. Other guys definitely don't want that. You know, they just want like a consistent, X, you know, seeing X number of patients per month, making X amount of money, being able to work, you know, X number of days, and they're like, they're set. So it's going to be unique for everybody, but you have to look at what is your ideal scene and a practice that is marketing well on all channels does evolve into the obvious choice and they consequently own their town. The ideal scene must be, must be worked out and once that's envisioned, then you can work out the cl clear targets that can be accomplished step by step that will actually get you there. Um, and then I just wanted to add that you can contact me for a free marketing analysis where I will actually like do an in-depth interview with you and. We can look over all your current channels of marketing. We can look at the real stats of what each area is producing and work out a plan to strengthen the, the right things that are already happening and fill in the gaps um, where you could be getting, you know, other channels that you could start to work where you could start to really, really, really increase your info. All right? So I would like to conclude with what questions do you have and what would you like to know more about? And I'd like to hear from you, so you can go ahead and email me here at qc at galaxymarketingsolutions.com. That's my email. It's Mac Leeson. And um, that's a town, like the one you should own, <laughs> that picture. Okay. 
And then the final thing I want to say is um, we actually have, you know, we're kind of on a rampage or right now of just like very educational because marketing really is a team action. And I don't think there's any marketing company alive, no matter how brilliant the personnel may be, that can just do it all by themselves off in their office. Like it's a very cooperative effort between the marketing firm and the client. And the more they're on the same page and the more they're mutually educated, the more of a team you get. And we really emphasize that team action here at Galaxy because it just it simply works the best. And it's the most fun and you get the best results. So um, we're on a rampage of just like an educational mission. And so we have an event coming up for the people that are here in the Florida area. Um, this is a new patient event. It's on November 14th. And this is going to cover some great stuff. It's going to, you're going to find out how to create messages that impact and drive new patients into your practice. Um, come to our free workshop and receive a personalized marketing analysis. It's a $1,500 value, which includes the answers to these important questions. How visible is your website to top search? Can new patients find you online? How effective is your word of mouth marketing program? Do you have effective direct mail campaigns? How healthy is your social media? How do you stay in touch with your existing patients and drive them in for further services, et cetera? And we actually have a super guest speaker. Uh, his name is Patrick Bolton. He's the CEO of New Era Management. He is a world-class uh, speaker. He literally flies around the world. We were able to catch him while he was in town, and he was able to book this event with us. But he is a guy, if you are in Tampa, area or anywhere in Florida, he's worth coming and checking out. He's going to set the whole stage for what's happening with marketing these days, just what an impact it has. And then in the second part, I'm going to come in with a real hands-on, and this is going to be a very hands-on workshop with like um, designing your own postcard, how to do surveys, how to tabulate them, you know, what really constitutes a good advertisement, what does a bad advertisement look like, what does a good advertisement look like. You're really going to walk away with some very hands-on knowledge of marketing, and then you all get a free marketing analysis um, that you can just run with, okay? So that's uh, my offer to you. Give us a call, okay, if you're in Tampa or, or around Florida and you want to come, we'd love to have you. It's actually totally free. We include lunch, and it's kind of our gesture to the immediate area. We want to, we want to get involved and help you guys and educate you and have you be a huge success. All right? Okay, so that's the end of my program here. I really enjoy uh relaying this data to you, and I'm back every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East Coast time uh, with a webinar every week, so I look forward to seeing you soon, okay? Thank you very much.